Hi team, I wanted to show you a hopefully short video um, about some slides on different types of bombs. So the um, learning objectives of this uh, set of slides has to do with differentiating between covalent and weak bonds, um, describing the types of molecules which different weak bonds might form between, and uh, I want us to be able to list different biochemical processes that might rely on each different type of weak bond. So um, it's important for you to know, uh, and you've probably already learned in chemistry, that um, different electronegativity of the elements that are forming bonds can lead to um, partial negative and partial positive charges, even when we're talking about a covalent bond. So here on the left, we have, um, oh, I kind of want to use the laser pointer. Here on the left, we've got a nonpolar covalent bond. So this, the covalent bonds, the strongest type of bonds, we've got electrons being shared equally between these two atoms. And because they're both chlorines, they both have the same electronegativity, they're sharing those electrons equally. In a polar covalent bond, um, we can get partial positive and partial negative charges because the electrons are shared unequally. In this case, chlorine is more electronegative, and so it's stealing the, uh, it's greedy for those electrons, so, and hydrogen is not, so it's a little more positive over here, fewer electrons, more negative over here. So even within a covalent bond, we can have different um, slight um, dipoles or slight uh, charges, partial charges. Um, and then of course this is made most extreme in an ionic bond where an electron from one molecule, for example from sodium, is completely donated to the other molecule, chlorine. And chlorine here you can see is much bigger and it's also more electronegative than sodium. So I've mentioned electronegativity a couple of times here. Um, check out this electronegativity table. It just came from Wikipedia. And you can see the increasing redness of each of the elements here is noting uh, the most electronegativity of, uh, the more red, the more electronegative is what I'm trying to say. The more red, the more electronegative. So the embedded video question here, consider the five or six or so elements that are really biologically, biochemically important. Which one has the strongest electronegativity? Which one of these elements is gonna be the most greedy for electrons? Let me know. I'll post a place for you to upload your embedded question answers online. So we've talked about covalent bonds, um, but I also want for us to mention the really important types of weak bonds that exist in biochemistry. Um, we've already mentioned ionic bonds, which are weaker than covalent bonds, but they're the strongest of these weak bonds. Um, hydrophobic interactions, quite strong. Hydrogen bonds or H bonds, and the weakest van der Waals forces. So let's start by talking about ionic bonds. As we've already mentioned, ionic bonds occur when an electron is transferred from the less electronegative molecule to the more electronegative molecule, and the result is that both molecules have a charge, but then they're attracted to one another um, and they tend to stick together like sodium chloride does. Um, and these ionic bonds, um, you can see this beautiful like matrix of ionic bonds over here, they can be disrupted by water. And that's because water does have a dipole. Water um, has an oxygen group that is very electronegative and hydrogens, which are much less, not really electronegative. Um, so water can come in and interact with each of these charged ions. Um, dissolving the ionic bond. Um, so ionic bonds are really easily disrupted by water. 
And many, many types of polar molecules are really easily dissolved in water. That's one of the reasons that water is so important for life. Um, let's talk a little bit about hydrophobic interactions. Remember, these are the next strongest. They're quite essential for nonpolar molecules. So that means molecules that don't have um, a charge attached to them, or even this um, slight positive, slight negative charge. Um, because nonpolar molecules aren't attracted to water, they need to find a way to sort of stick together away from water. Um, hydrophobic interactions are key for proteins to fold. Um, and these bonds are quite high energy because they rely and they rely on the second law of thermodynamics, which is entropy. So let's talk a little bit about entropy for a moment. Entropy is a measure of randomness and it increases in a system spontaneously. So you know about this. Um, if you don't clean up the living room, randomness enters. Without you putting energy in, your living room is going to look like chaos. Uh, it's not going to be neatly organized into, into separate uh, slots. So entropy increases spontaneously. So let's think about what this means in a biochemical system, for example. When we have a nonpolar molecule, here it's yellow, added to water, it's gonna disrupt the hydrogen bonds that are forming between the water molecules. Now, normally water all by itself is forming a ton, a ton of hydrogen bonds and it's totally random. They have so many options of where they can form these hydrogen bonds. But when hydrogen bonds reform around this nonpolar molecule, there are fewer positions um, for hydrogen bonds to be formed because some space is being taken up by this nonpolar molecule. That means that order, at least in this small area, has increased. Order has increased. Entropy has decreased. And that's not nature's favorite way of being. So let's talk about what happens when we add a second nonpolar molecule into this uh, system. With a second nonpolar molecule, we're not going to end up with these two molecules each holding their own separate ordered pockets of the water. Instead, they're going to come together and interact um, so that the water molecules have more opportunity to form hydrogen bonds. They're going back to being as random as they can possibly be. Order is decreasing, so entropy is increased. Since entropy is increasing, this uh, nonpolar interaction, this hydrophobic interaction, occurs spontaneously since it's um, going with the entropy gradient. Hydrophobic interactions are one of the types of bonds that helps keep proteins together as they're folding. So we've already spoken about ionic bonds, and you can see some amino acids have a charge on them, a full formal charge, so that they can form ionic bonds. Some amino acids have um, oxygen and hydrogen on them, so or nitrogen, so that they can form hydrogen bonds. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, Oh, this type of uh, protein structure is caused by covalent bonds between sulfur groups. But hydrophobic interactions are the only type of interaction that can be formed, um, other than van der Waals interactions, that can be formed between nonpolar amino acids like valine here. Um, and Having hydrophobic or nonpolar regions of proteins is really essential. So what I'm showing you here is a, a membrane, a lipid bilayer inside your cell. And you can see these two proteins, one has one transmembrane domain, and this one has three transmembrane domains. These are called integral membrane proteins because they're integrated within the membrane. And each of these proteins has essential hydrophobic regions of the protein. So these are going to be filled with nonpolar amino acids. And then the parts of the protein that are exposed to the extracellular matrix or to the cytoplasm are going to have more polar or hydrophilic regions. But having these hydrophobic regions means we can have proteins that are associated with the membrane. And that's pretty key. 
Let's talk for a moment about hydrogen bonds. They're often shown as dashed lines and they can occur between water molecules anywhere, um, but also many other molecules that have um, polarity due to unequal electronegativity. And hydrogen bonds are gonna be forming between an oxygen and a hydrogen. Um, and that hydrogen needs to be attached to another electronegative element like nitrogen. Uh, we could draw this the other way around and have, um, or over here we've got oxygen attached to hydrogen and that hydrogen is hydrogen bonding to an oxygen. Um, so we're gonna have uh, one hydrogen and two electronegative atoms in this equation. And these electronegative atoms can be oxygens, they can be nitrogens, uh, and that's gonna be the most common we see in biochemistry. Have hydrogen attached, or hydrogen bonding rather, to an oxygen or to a nitrogen. Terrific. Um, what's interesting about covalent bonds, I think, is that they can actually be longer, they are longer than did I say it right? Hydrogen bonds are longer than covalent bonds. Really interesting. And like ionic bonds, they can be disrupted by water because water is a big fan of forming hydrogen bonds. Um, and so this hydrogen bond between two biologically important molecules can be disrupted um, and replaced with one water molecule interacting with one and a second water molecule interacting with another um, biological molecule. Hydrogen bonds are really important for our nucleic acids. Um, they hold our DNA strands together. And so you can see each of these bars over here represents um, two or three hydrogen bonds keeping the DNA base pairs together. But these hydrogen bonds can be easily broken. For example, RNA polymerase, as it moves down the DNA chain to create a new strand of RNA, is breaking temporarily the hydrogen bonds between the double helix of DNA. And then these hydrogen bonds can fold right back up together again. The last type of force we're gonna talk about is van der Waals forces. And these are the weakest of the weak forces that we're gonna talk about today. And they occur in nonpolar, non-charged molecules, but they still have to do with dipoles or partial positive, partial negatives. Um, so these are gonna be occurring not with charged molecules, not with polar molecules, but with nonpolar molecules, the same type of molecules that would do hydrophobic interactions. And these uh, van der Waals forces are due to the fact that as two atoms come close to one another, um, variation in momentary variation where the electron cloud is around that molecule can result in momentary or instantaneous dipoles. You can see over here the electron cloud is on this left side so we've got a electronegative side of the molecule which leaves this side of the molecule a little more electropositive and that can induce neighboring molecules to have a dipole as well. So these are induced dipoles. Go to the next one. Um, and these induced dipoles are really only gonna happen at very specific distances between the atoms. Um, if the atoms are too far apart, or rather if the molecules are too far apart, um, there's not gonna be any attraction. They're too far to make a difference. As they come closer and closer together, there's going to be an increase in attraction between those induced dipoles. Um, but then as the molecules come too close together, the electron clouds can start to overlap and the electrons will repel one another. So the closer you get, you actually lose van der Waals interactions. So these um, van der Waals interactions are due to really close physical distances, but it can't be like subatomically close. All right, I think that's all I wanted to tell you about weak bonds today. Um, so don't forget that embedded question about electronegativity.